Let's all stand. Please grab your songbook. We're going to turn to number two, right at the front of the book there. Number two, Amazing Grace. As we sing it out, let's prepare our hearts, get some good teaching tonight, take something away from the Lord we can apply to our lives. Number two, Amazing Grace. singing you may be seated amen very good we're in judges don't continue been a uh, couple weeks now since we were in judges and um, appreciate the guys brother paul brother jack that uh, that filled in last couple thursdays Great job that they did. We're going to pick it up back in chapter 17. Now, by way of review, this is a short uh, chapter tonight, but by way of review, if you, we have covered the first two major points of the book of Judges. There were three, if you remember, when we outlined the book. And there was, uh, uh, number one, there was the apathy of the nation of Israel. Apathy of the nation. That was in chapters one and two. And the apathy was that at the time of Judges, they were ready to take the land, ready to go claim all the tribes, go claim the land, live in the land. And, um, you know, Joshua had them all set up. And the apathy was that they let the uh, inhabitants serve under tribute. Then they let the inhabitants kind of take over. And then they were just lazy about what God called them to do. And when you're lazy about what, call, what God calls you to do, when you become a lazy Christian, apathetic you're set up for number two number two was chapters three through 16 and uh that's apostasy when you have apathy in your life you're going to have apostasy what does apostasy mean apostasy first of all apo apo that means to go away from so apostasy is when you go away from god when you go away from his law when you go away from his principles you basically have uh have just said you've almost renounced by your lifestyle you know i'm an apostate i'm an apostasy i'm not living what i say that i was living you know so you've gone away from god and you've renounced those things so that's what we saw in chapters 3 through 16 and we saw 12 judges in the book and we ended up uh last week we finished samson who was the 12th and final judge and we saw that everything is being set up now for the last five chapters 17 through 21 is point number three of the book which is past apostasy it's anarchy now we've seen a little bit of it already and you're going to see us really set up for it tonight's kind of a bridge chapter from the apostasy to the anarchy and anarchy is just lawlessness not that they haven't done that already but this is there's some, there's just some strange things that happened in these last five chapters, all right? 
and you just wonder, you'll look at it, you'll read it, and you'll go, what happened here? How did they ever, how would anybody ever be treated like this? How would they ever do this? Um, because it started with apathy. And then it went to apostasy when it came to, uh, when it came to your belief system. And then it becomes anarchy. And you can look at, you know, uh, you can probably look at our nation, the United States of America, and you can see how we start strong, we started and all that. And you could look at it at some point, we became lazy with, within the faith apathy just kind of eh, oh, all right well yeah you know well then that turned into apostasy <laughs> where we really started not to live out the faith as much as a country and look look what we have today <laughs> anarchy lawlessness that's where we're dealing with lawlessness so you can see that it certainly is a real life example when you we're we're reading in the book of judges some 1400 BC, and yet here we are 3,400 years later, and we're living the same kind of thing in, in our country. So we can learn a lot from the book of Judges in that way. So we're into chapter 17. Again, it's a short chapter, but it does lay a foundation for the remaining four chapters after it into this, uh, this anarchy. Okay, and God will remind us exactly uh, what we've known all along the the um, the theme, <laughs> the theme of Judges. All right, so chapter seventeen. Remember now, uh, the judges are done. Samson is done. The twelve judges are, are a thing of the past. And when you remember, he was sold out in chapter sixteen, verse five, when. Uh, Delilah sold him out, and this is going to be relevant to what we're going to get into here in a couple verses, but in chapter 16, verse 5, it says, the lords of the Philistines came up unto her, that's Delilah, and said unto her, entice him, and see wherein his great strength lieth, and by what means we may prevail against him, that we may bind him to afflict him, and we will give thee, every one of us, 1,100 pieces of silver. So I just want you to mark that. Right now, the 1,100 pieces of silver. All right, so chapter 17, verse 1, and it says, And there was a man of Mount Ephraim whose name was Micah. And Micah becomes an interesting character. Who was Micah? We don't know a lot about Micah. But he lived in Mount Ephraim. And here's what he says in verse 2. And he said unto his mother, don't know much about his mother, said unto his mother, the 1,100 shekels of silver that were taken from thee about which thou cursest and spakest of also in mine ears, behold, the silver is with me, I took it. And his mother said, blessed be thou of the Lord, my son. So I say this, now it may be a complete coincidence that it's 1,100 shekels uh, of silver could be a complete coincidence but it matches what Delilah was promised and so Micah may have been one of the men who promised Delilah 1100 uh, pieces of silver I don't know some would say that Micah's mother might be Delilah that's complete conjecture and uh, you, you know speculation I don't know that to be the case. But one way or another, Micah stole this 1,100 pieces of silver from his mother at some point. Now, if he took it from her to pay off Delilah, it would appear that Delilah never got that money. Or as I said, I would think that if this is Delilah, we would be told it's Delilah. So either way, what happens is Micah, we start off, took, robbed his mother of 1,100 shekels of silver and then said, you remember that money that you were cursing about that somebody took? Um, I've got it. I took it. And so the woman cursed and ended up cursing her son uh, and then when she got it back, she blessed him 
Oh, blessed be thou the Lord, my son. So interestingly enough, you kind of get a feel for the character. You're going to see a few things about these people. But the mom, when she lost 1,100 shekels of silver, she cursed. She cursed somebody over it. And then when it was given back to her, she blessed uh, her son. Uh, blessed be thou of the Lord, my son. It is an interesting thing to me in the same verse, a cursing and the blessing, not over spiritual things, over money. Someone took my money, you ripped me off, curse you. Somebody gave me money, bless you. Somebody gave me my money back, bless you. And it, it's, I got to thinking about this. She's like most people. <laughs> Cursed when things go bad, curses. And blessings when they go good <laughs> to your favor. Exactly what we see in this verse. Again, we're setting up the whole, this whole thing of, honestly, we're setting up a whole priesthood in this chapter. A whole priesthood, a whole false priesthood to come is laid in this chapter, in this foundation, in this 13 verses. No coincidence that it's 13 verses. Cursed, blessing. Oh, what a blessing. What a blessing I got to raise. What a blessing. My job's going, what a blessing. And then, curse you all. Curse you all that. Uh, I lost my job. Curse you that it, money's not going the way I want it to. Hey, I, I get it. But at the same time, um, we, to, we, we bless the Lord at all times. Do you see the contradiction in these verses? I dedicated this silver to the Lord. You did? How did you do that? Well, Get a graven image and a molten image out of it. Yeah, that's not that's not dedicating it to the Lord. Not in the least bit. So although she mentions the Lord, you know what she is here? According to this verse, she is an idolater. She's an idol worshiper. Images, uh, we're going to see that. Idols, images, uh, she paid somebody to make a graven image, a molten image, and uh, while doing that, she dedicated it to the Lord. No. No, we don't dedicate images and idols to the Lord. Uh, the Lord is, you should know this, the Lord is far from those things. Okay? Verse 4 Yet he restored the money, uh, uh, the money unto his mother, and his mother took two hundred shekels of silver and gave them to the founder, who made thereof a graven image and a molten image, and they were in the house of Micah. So again, gives them the money. She takes the two, 200 of the shekels and gives it to the guy who's going to build it, the founder, okay, who makes these images. Then in verse number five, it tells us, and the man Micah had a house of gods and made an ephod and a teraphim and consecrated one of his sons who became his priest. There's a lot in that verse. Again, we're laying the foundation of absolute anarchy. It starts with false religion. Micah had a house of gods. Isn't that something? This is my house of gods. I don't know if he had a shed, uh, you know, big house, little house, filled with idols, graven images, house of gods. Um, he no doubt, though, learned to be an idolater from whom? <laughs> His mom taught him well, didn't she? He learned how to be an idolater. 
He had his own house of gods. Uh, he made an ephod, which be, the, the, an ephod was for the Levitical priests. Uh, the ephod was kind of like the poncho that the priest, Levitical priests wore, the cape uh, poncho that went over uh, their garments. And uh, that, and in the middle of that um, ephod was where the breastplate was, where it housed the breastplate of all the stones and things. So that was what the ephod was. So we saw that uh, this was done earlier too by getting an ephod. So I'm about an ephod, making your own ephod. I, I'm going to be religious. I'm going to make me an ephod. Make me a robe. Okay. How many religions today? They want to be religious, so they wear garbs, vestures, right? To make them look religious. It's nothing to do with anything. You're not religious just because you wear that. Okay? Um, you know, I, I was, uh, it, it's interesting. I, I, I would much rather, I was uh, at my, my good friend is a Supreme Court Justice Steve Lindley, and he gave me a tour of his office one day, and we're walking around this and that, and he's like, yeah, these are the chambers, and it was kind of cool. This is the, you know, appellate court in fourth district, and, uh, you know, he's showing me around. This is where we, you know, sit, hear the cases. I'm like, this is kind of neat, and he went to this uh, closet. He opens the closet, and he goes, there's all our robes. I go, wow. He goes, yeah, it's a big deal. He goes, they robe us. Like they, 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 somebody puts the robes on them. Like they can't even put their own robe on. You know, they have like this before they go out. They put the robes on. Like, wow, that's kind of like weird. <laughs> you know, like, you know, you, you judge or a priest or, you know, I mean, you kind of get that, that vibe, you know. Now, these guys back here, uh, I feel weird. Uh, I feel important, but I feel weird every Sunday. I will come back to get mic'd, and they will converge on me and uh, make sure it's all... Listen, I, I deserve it because I'm, they know I'm crazy fussy. Nope, it's got to be right. Nope, it's got to be taped. Nope, it's got to be on the ear just right. You know, all those things. Now, this was after years of, and you, some of you remember it, when I'm preaching and the thing's going this way, the thing's going this way, and I keep doing this, and it's falling off my ear, and it's, you know, and learning over the years, you know? And it's like, now it's like, no, get it on there, make sure it hugs my ear, and then we tape it. You know, I want to make sure I'm not up there playing with it and all that. So, anyway, so we go through this little ceremony, it seems like, and uh, then they robe me. And they're like, where's your jacket? Here, I got it. Guys, I can put on my own jacket. I really can. They're like, nope, we're putting the jacket on you. So I'm like, we can go through our own little ceremony. So <laughs> religious garbs, this is my suit jacket, you know. But it's interesting what people will get out of a vesture, whether it's a Supreme Court justice or whether it's, uh, you know, a religious priest or whatever, it, the ephod was a big deal. It's like, yeah, I got my own ephod. I've got my own robe for this, you know. Um, I don't know. And, then, you know, people, uh, some churches, it's, Choir robes are a big deal, and you know, uh, baptismal robes are a big deal, and you know, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so he, he's got an ephod, and then he says he's got a teraphim. Now, the best I could do with a teraphim is the Bible doesn't define exactly what a teraphim is, and it's kind of it's everybody's guess what a teraphim is. It is definitely some sort of household idol that we can all agree on. They've got a teraphim is your own household idol for your home. Okay. Some say it's a miniature statue. You know, I could see that. Listen, when I was uh, when I was a kid growing up, you know, everybody drove around on their dash with a little miniature Jesus or a miniature Mary. We rode on our dash. I mean, 
I cannot even gonna say. What you people, the same people smoking and boozing in that car. <laughs> I mean, yeah, there's Mary, <laughs> there's Jesus on the dash, you know. <laughs> but anyway, that might be what a teraphim was. I don't know. I, I, I'm not sure. But a teraphim was a was an idol. It was an idol meant for somebody's household, um, some family idol. So Micah has a house of gods, the ephod, and teraphim. And then he consecrates one of his sons who became his priest. Again, Micah, we don't know who you are. We don't know what tribe you're from. We don't know what lineage you are. But you're going to just say, son, why? Because they have, they have just desecrated our neighborhood because they have plants and trees everywhere around their whole house. I mean, like they're, like they're plant, these are big plants. They, they're obviously harvesting their own fruits or vegetables or whatever they're doing. And they got these huge cinder blocks like big diameter of cinder blocks with a tree stuck in it. This is all in their front yard. <laughs> you know, and when you come come by, you'll see what I'm talking about. Oi! No code. Apparently there's no town code. Apparently there's, they're not doing anything wrong. So they do all this. They, plants everywhere. Living off the land. They have a living room. Their picture window living room is dedicated to idols. They don't live in their living room. They live in their garage, even in the wintertime. They've taken themselves out of their living room because when you look in, when the lights are on, especially at night, you can see there's statues of Buddha. I could swear it's a statue of Mary. I don't know. There's statues and idols everywhere. That's their house of gods. And so then they converge. They stay in the, in the garage, nice in the summer. Uh, in the wintertime, they've got one of those big, like, plastic bubbles around it to try to keep, keep it warm in there. It's just, a lot of this stems from their religion, their house of gods. Uh, got their groves, whatever they're doing. Um, I don't know. I, I could see where it's a house of gods. You know, you Italians understand that your grandmother had a room nobody went in, right? Sam? No? Okay. Help me. Cheryl, do you see it? My grandmother had a room nobody went in. It was a little, like a little extra living room, but it was like, I don't know, knickknacks, ceramics, this, that, shape, plastic, and, you know, every, it, it was weird. I never really understood it. I guess her house of idols. Not uncommon from what I understand from our heritage and that generation. So Micah's got his own house of gods with the ephods, the teraphims, and consecrates one of his sons to become a priest. That's all great. Now what does the Lord think of all this? Here's the disclaimer he throws in in verse 6. This is great. This is the theme. This is the theme of Judges right here. In those days there was no king in Israel but every man did that which is right in his own eyes. Now that right there is just, that just tells you right there, God's throwing in, I have nothing to do with what's happening in this chapter. Nothing. All right, this is not for me, because they keep mentioning the Lord. So it's a disclaimer. He didn't sanction any of it. He didn't sanction the, the idols, didn't sanction consecrating a priest uh, of his own son. None of it. So, chapter this chapter and the next week, chapter 17 and 18, you're going to see this, are the beginnings of what we know as Roman Catholicism. This is really where it shows up in the Bible. Because you're going to see in the next two chapters, 
idols and priests and father, religious father, and a lot of things that we are accustomed to. And remember this, the Ten Commandments are very clear. Number two is very clear. Thou shalt make no, I shalt not make any, any graven images, right? Listen, how do you get around that? God says, no graven images. No idols, no statues, nothing. You, you can't have them. How do, you get, how do you get around it? I'll tell you how they got around it. I don't know if you know this or not. Roman Catholicism has its own set of Ten Commandments. Nine out of ten are the same. Number two is stricken. <laughs> Number two is gone. Well, think about it. How could you have number two and then have a church filled with statues and images? You couldn't. So they struck number two, and to make ten, they split number ten. Thou shalt not covet. They split it into two. Shall not covet a man's wife. They shall not covet a man's property, I think they say. something His goods. His wife and his goods. So they split number ten into two. So now they have a nice, tidy ten commandments, but number two is gone. In fact, one night, I'll tell you what, I was watching Jeopardy, and I would have lost Final Jeopardy. Would have lost Final Jeopardy because I said uh, Commandment 4 was the, uh, the Sabbath day. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Jeopardy said it was Commandment 3. You know why? Because they struck number 2 out and moved them all up. I'm like, that guy should have not gotten that wrong. I would. I was furious, and I don't even care, you know. So, can you believe that? So, there's Protestant and Catholic sets of Ten Commandments, and this sets that precedent for here. You, you know, I mean, look at what they're doing: idols, idols, images. So this allows anyone to do what, what we see here. This, this would allow, taking number two out allows anyone to do what we see here, um, worshiping idols and images. We all, we all, do, I say we all, we did, I did. I did. I used to pray at Bathtub Mary in my grandmother's backyard. I used to sit there and pray at the feet of Mary. It was the half bathtub in the ground, the shrine, uh, and Mary, Statue of Mary. You know, Bathtub Mary, we call her. My neighbors have one. Bathtub Mary. There's Bathtub Mary. Just what kind of culture did I grow up in? I know, it's weird, isn't it? But it allows us, justifies to, to, to worship images and idols. So as the Lord says, when there's no king, when there's no leader here, when there's no leader, people fall into idolatry. This is, by the way, this is like, I don't care where you are. I don't care if you're in a church. If you've got no strong leadership, you'll fall into idolatry yourself. I don't mean, and I don't mean praying to the little miniature Marys and Jesus. That's not what I'm talking about. Idolatry. You don't have a leader, somebody to keep that in check. Uh, you don't have a good, you know, accountability group. We all will fall into some sort of idolatry. It doesn't have to be religious images. When Moses went to the mount, here's Moses going up to the mount for 40 days. He's going up there to get the commandments of God. And what are the people doing? Less than 40 days, they're worshiping idols. They're carving images, a golden calf out. And less than 40, their leader was gone. They were like, we don't know what happened to Moses. We don't know what's going on. Hey, let's do this. It didn't take long, did it? Well, that teaches us. If you don't have some strong leadership or you don't have some accountability, people fall into idolatry, worshiping false gods. So let's be reminded and look up a few verses in the New Testament. First one is 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and then we'll get Galatians, and then we'll get Colossians. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 
In 1 Corinthians 10, we're told in uh, verse uh, 13, you know, or 12, uh, uh, let him that think that he stand and take heed lest he fall. There is no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Wherefore, he continues the thought, don't fall into temptation. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. So he's saying, look it, temptation is common to man, and don't think that you're going to stand and, and, and everyone else is going to fall. Um, but God is faithful, who will keep you from the temptation if you allow him to. And with that thought, he throws in, wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. Don't get sucked into the idols. Don't get sucked into idolatry, because that's one of the things that are very common for people, especially Americans, to get into I idols, idols, idolatry. All right, um, think about that next time you watch American Idol. It's American idolatry. It's American idolatry. It's not American Idol. It's American idolatry. Galatians chapter 5 uh, verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry. That's for, for a New Testament Christian. Idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, continues on. But idolatry is in their um, list. And then Colossians chapter number three in Colossians three it says in verse five mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth fornication uncleanness inordinate affection evil concupiscence and covetousness which is another name for idolatry Covetousness. What happens when we covet? Oh, I want to, oh, I want to have, give me one of those. It becomes an idol. Covetousness, which is idolatry. Okay, so, so this is a, uh, this becomes a continual um, problem for everyone in the scriptures. It could be in a religious context, um, but it also can be in a commercialization context. You know, it could be, could be in the things that we like. They don't have to be little idols, right? They don't have to be uh, statues, okay? They could just be things that we worship. All right, so Judges chapter 17 then, he, God says, remember, when you read all this nonsense, remember, every man did that which is right in his own eyes. That's what was happening here in the book of Judges. Still, all right, now we go to verse 7, 17, 7. And there was a young man out of Bethlehem, Judah, of the family of Judah, who was a Levite, and he sojourned there. You have a Levite out of the family of Judah. Now, they're different. Judah and Levi are different tribes. But because he's called a Levite, uh, this appeals, this is going to appeal to Micah. Now, something you need to understand about the Levites. Uh, all priests, God, in God's classification, all priests were Levites. But all Levites were not priests. So just because you're a Levite doesn't qualify you to be a priest. Okay. Um, the priests were Levites, but not all Levites were priests. In God's, in God's um, program, the priestly line came through Aaron. You had to be of Aaron's heritage. All right? So that's one thing that, that you need to establish is, is they go around just throwing these Levites into priestly positions. It doesn't mean they qualified by any means. So here comes a Levite. 
and he's hanging out there. In verse 8, it says, And the man departed out of the city from Bethlehem, Judah, to sojourn where he could find a place. And he came to Mount Ephraim to the house of Micah as he journeyed. So this guy wanders into um, uh, Micah's uh, territory. And Micah said unto him, Whence comest thou? And he said unto him, I am a Levite of Bethlehem, Judah, and I go to sojourn where I may find a place. Now, find a place to live, I assume, because at this point, everyone did that which is right in his own eyes, and the Levites, they didn't really have their own plot of land. They had cities, and I would imagine at this time in Judges that that's probably all gone by the wayside. The Levites probably were like sojourners, wanderers. There's no cities dedicated to them. Okay, there were supposed to be, but why would there be? So he's probably like a vagabond. He's right looking, I gotta find a place that I can dwell, a place to live. He can have a tribe of his own as a Levite. All right, but he you know, hung around there in Bethlehem, Judah. So this guy's trying to figure out where to live. So he wanders to Micah. Now that's all Micah's gotta hear now. You're a Levite? Man. Remember he had consecrated his son to be a priest? <laughs> Move over, boy. <laughs> we got us a Levite here, you know. Yeah, that's, we got a real one here. And Micah said unto him, verse 10, Micah said unto him, Dwell with me and be unto me a father and a priest. See that? Now in verse 7, this is a young man. This is a young man, younger than Micah, but be unto me a father in a religious context, and a priest. And I will give thee 10 shekels of silver by the year and a suit of apparel. There we go again. There's the garbs and a suit of apparel and thy victuals. So the Levite went in. How can he turn it down? So he wants him to be a father and a priest with pay. He's going to pay him to do it. He's going to house him to do it. He's going to give him special vestures to do it. Just like we see today. Same stuff. Oh, you live here. The, the priest lives in this house. The priest dresses this way. The priest gets his expenses paid for him. You know, he, he lives here for free. And, you know, and all of the same stuff that we see. Even, even his clothing. So, uh, now remember... You've got to remember, too, even though we're used to it, the enemy, that spiritual father and priest, remember what Jesus said about that. All right, I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 23. In Matthew 23, of course, you have the Pharisees and, and all that, and he's um, condemning them for what they do in chapter 23 and what they like. And if you think about it, the description of these Pharisees in Matthew 23 really could fit people in a, the clergy position. Uh, verse 3, And therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do not after their works, for they say and do not. <laughs> That's true. They shouldn't do this, but I do it. For they bind heavy burdens, grievous to be born, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. There it is, all the stuff, the, the scriptures that they had around the headband, the phylacteries, the borders of their garments, uh, special they love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogue, right? We still, you still see that in a religious sense. Father, 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 over here, Father, sit here. Right? Greetings in the markets to be called men, Rabbi, Rabbi, I want to be called. You call me Pastor, son. You don't call me Bob. That's not my name. It's Pastor, right? You know, I mean, look at me, the Rabbi, Rabbi. Verse 8, but be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ. Don't use the term in a religious sense, rabbi. That's wrong. We don't, obviously. 
But then he says in the same sense, and call no man your father upon the earth. He's not talking about your biological father. That was okay. He's talking about religious. Don't call anyone in a religious sense your father. Call no man your father upon the earth. For one is your father which is in heaven. Right? I mean, the Pope is basically uh, the stand-in for Christ on earth. That's what they believe. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. <laughs> uh -uh. Nobody gets that title. So when we go back, and this is established under Micah, the Lord's like, no, 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 no. We don't do this. So be unto me a father and a priest. So back to our text, Judges 17. Verse 11, And the Levite was content to dwell with the man, and the young man was unto him as one of his sons. So he took care of him. He religiously, he was a, uh, a spiritual father to him, but it, practically he was like one of his own kids. And Micah consecrated the Levite, and the young man became his priest, and it was in the house of Micah. Again, he had no authority whatsoever to consecrate him, a religious you know, service as a priest. Um, but then again, this was not God's choice. This was not God's priest whatsoever. And in the last verse it says, Then said Micah, Now... Know I that the Lord will do me good. Why, Micah? Seeing I have a Levite to my priest. No, that's not going to get God's goodness. It's a false assumption. In fact, it's going to be quite the contrary. God did not like this. God, the Lord was very fussy with his priesthood, with his legitimate priesthood of the tribe of Levi, the sons of Aaron. And if anybody infringed on that, he was not happy with it, he never was. Or if they did it wrong, they messed around with the office, he did not like that. And I'm going to show you a few examples. When someone either infringed on the office of the priest or did things with the wrong heart, the wrong way, the Lord was angry with this. Now, I'll show you a few examples. If you go back... Um, to the book of Leviticus. I'll show you a couple things on the priesthood and then we'll be finished. Le Leviticus chapter 10. Now, if you want to know about the Levitical priesthood, the book of Leviticus will tell you an awful lot about it, teach you an awful lot about this. In Leviticus 10, it said, in Nadab and Abihu, they were sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. So there were these censers. You know, the censers weigh the censers. The smoke comes out of it. you got the chemicals in there or the whatever in there. And the smoke, you ever been to a Catholic funeral and, <laughs> you know, it smells and, you know, they're waving all that stuff around. Where'd they get that from? The Levites. So, but the Lord was very particular what to put in those censers. You mix this and you mix that. Don't mix anything else. Did I tell you not to mix? Don't offer that before me. And sure enough, they decide, let's make our own concoction for whatever reason. And they offer strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them and they died before the Lord. Now this is, this is a quick hitter. Uh, it doesn't say much other than, and uh, the Lord struck him dead with fire of his own. These are, listen, these are Aaron's sons. Your head priest. These are his kids. And the Lord says, uh-uh, bam, you're dead. Hey. Verse three, then Moses said unto Aaron, this is it. 
that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh at me. And before all the people, I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. Listen, I am sure Aaron had something to say about this and was upset. But he knew not to. Shh, be quiet, Aaron. Moses is like, Aaron, quiet, before you get struck too, you know. And he held his peace. The Lord's like, no, I'm not messing with this. This is my office. Think about this. This is his sanctified office of the priesthood for these people only. All right, uh, Judges chapter 8. Judges 8. And we, we looked at this already, but this was the downfall of Gideon. As, as great as Gideon was and what Gideon did um, in being a warrior, in 827 it says, and Gideon made an ephod. That was a big mistake. That was an idol. And it says, and all Israel went thither a whoring after it, which seen became a snare unto Gideon and to his house. Gideon made an ephod of his own, and the Lord's like, mm, mm, mm. no, 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 an ephod is not, an ephod's for the priests. And then it tells us, uh, verse 32, Gideon died in good old age, they bury him. Verse 33, as soon as it came to pass, as soon as Gideon was dead, that the children of Israel turned again and went a whoring after Balaam, made Baal bear their God. And the children of Israel remembered not the Lord their God, who had delivered them out of the hand of all their enemies on every side. Neither showed they any kindness as the house of Jeroboam, which was Gideon, namely Gideon, according to all the goodness which he had showed unto his... By Gideon making this ephod, it was a huge downfall for him, for his descendants, for his memory. Don't mess. Don't mess. Now, 1 Samuel chapter 13. This is King Saul, who was supposed to wait for Samuel. Now, Saul was the king. There's three major offices in the Old Testament. The prophet, the priest, and the king. The prophet's the, the prophet. He's preaching. He's out there preaching. You know, um, the priest would be in this particular case because it's it's um, uh, sanctioned of the Lord. Samuel was allowed to to utilize the office of a, pri a priest and offer offerings. And then there was the king. The king was the king. Well, the king was the king and was not to be the priest. You could not hold those three offices. It's very rare. You know why? Because Jesus is prophet, priest, and king. So nobody was to have those three offices in one. So uh, anyway, I say that. Here's 1 Samuel 13. And verse 8. It says, uh, again, talking about King Saul. He tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. And Saul said, Bring hither a burnt offering to me, and peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. Was not supposed to touch it. That was for the priest. And it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of an offering of the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came and Saul went out to meet him that he might salute him. And Samuel said, What hast thou done? And Saul said, because I saw that the people were scattered from me and that thou camest not within the days appointed and that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Michmash, therefore said I, the Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal. And I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself therefore and offered a burnt offering. Sounds like a good motive. And Samuel said to Saul, thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever, but now thy kingdom shall not continue. Didn't obey. Infringed the point. The real violation is infringed on the office of priest. Can't do that. Can't do that. Not allowed to do that. So, Anyway, I say that to say this is what we're setting up here in Judges. False priesthood. Today, again, many false priests today. You could call, you could call I call out Roman Catholicism because they're the most obvious. You could look at any 
kind of religion that does the same types of things. They steal from Israel. Anyone that's got religious robes and garbs, that was for Israel, folks. We're never told that. We're never told to do that. That was something from Israel. You got they got uh, the religious colors. Those were for Israel, man. Those certain colors, uh, we'll look at in a second. Um, offering the incense, lighting the candles, any liturgical nonsense that you see is somebody trying to steal something that doesn't belong to them. Doesn't belong. So, again, obviously, our, our when I say our, our church, our Bible-believing circles, uh, the born-again Christians, you don't see any of that stuff in those types of churches, do you? The only one, the only churches you're going to see most of that stuff. And wait, I see some candles over there, Amy. Get those candles out of there. What are you what are those doing over there? You, um, the, the churches that you see with that stuff, the residual effect are the ones that would be called Protestant churches that spun off of Catholicism. Methodist, Lutheran, Episcopalian. Um, you could go on. They spun off, and you know what? They kept a little bit. There's always a little bit that they kept. Where'd you get that from? Hey, Mr. Methodist preacher, why do you wear a robe? I got that from our Catholic heritage. Why do you baptize kids, babies? I got that from... But our biblical line? We're not Protestant. You understand? People say you're Protestant. No, we're not. You know why we're not Protestant? We never came out of Catholicism. We were never in it. We were never in it. The Bible believers were never in Catholicism. They were their own line of Bible believers. That's why you don't see that stuff in Bible believing churches. They didn't have it to borrow. They never had it for themselves. So anyway, there's a lot of false priests and things like that out there. Vestures, colors, incense, stuff like that. We've got a few minutes. I'll just read you a couple things. Um, thinking back to the Levitical priesthood. From Exodus 28. If you want to read Exodus 28, there's you're going to get the garments and all that stuff and all the things they were supposed to do. But it says, Take thou unto the Aaron thy brother and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office, even Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, Eleazar, Ithamar, Aaron's sons. And thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron thy brother for glory and for beauty. Now shall speak unto all those that are wise-hearted whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. And these are the garments which they shall make, a breastplate and an ephod and a robe and a broidered coat and a miter. <laughs> know anyone that wears a miter? Pope? And a girdle. And they shall make holy garments for Aaron thy brother and his sons that he may minister unto me in the priest's office and they shall take listen to the colors now gold, blue, purple, scarlet and fine linen. Oh those are religious colors aren't they? Those are Israel's colors man. Leviticus 16 I'll just read that and we'll be done. Leviticus chapter 16 and verse 12, and again, this is Aaron, the priesthood. He shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar before the Lord, and his hands full of sweet incense, beaten small, and bring it within the veil. And he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony that he die not. And then it goes on sprinkling the blood and, and, and all that. So there were certain rituals. There was a certain look given, certain items given, certain rituals given, all belong to the Levitical priesthood. Nobody else gets that. No one. Only them. And so anything you see today is an imitation and a robbery of that. 
And what you have here in Judges, with this, they made they started making up their own priesthood. Idols, uh, vestures, ephods, father. Uh, uh, you know what this is? Anarchy. Anarchy. And then next week, this guy, this guy's, this is pretty funny. Micah gets his priest and his God stolen. Next week. How can your God be stolen? We're going to see that. All right. So that gives us a little bit of the foundation of, we'll continue in this vein next week because here comes a whole tribe who sets up a priesthood. And there, from there is essentially how this thing spread. This is kind of the beginnings of it. This is how it, how it spread. So not original, right? This is, it came from somewhere. So, all right? All right, it's 8.15, so I'll pray. And then um, I'm sure you're going to rush me with questions, and uh, then we can fellowship. Wait, wait a few minutes for everybody to get out, okay? Thank you, Lord, for this evening. Thank you for uh, giving us um, the Word of God and uh, giving us the examples of things that we should be avoiding uh, things that we could do better at, God, and I pray that you help us as we continue just processing um, the information and also as we continue forward finishing up the book of Judges. We're grateful uh, for the things you've taught us now in Jesus' name. Amen.